So welcome everybody to Progress TV, from the teachers, from the students of the Holy Family. We got the quiz extraordinaire with Mr. Cooney, then music with Miss Cochran and her jigs and reels. Story time with Miss McGowan, then some yoga, take a deep breath, sit down. Cooking corner with Miss Teresa Glynn, then a history challenge, send your projects in. Urban versus rural with Miss Kennedy, then the seasons with Miss Hines, what will they be? Then farm life with Mr. Bell, let's start with the quiz. Hope you do well. Hi guys, welcome back to this week's quiz. Okay, straight away we're going to get into, we're going to give a recap on the last quiz that we had. Okay, loads of people texted in the correct code. And the code that we got from question one, the country immediately to the south of America is Mexico. The indigenous people to the North Pole are of course the Eskimos. The Latino dance or the Latin dance which translates into sauce is salsa. The longest river in Ireland is the River Shannon. And on Fockel Gaeilgeir Ennis is Inish. So putting the first letter from each of those words together, we came up with the code, messy. Of course we did. Loads of people got those answers correct, and well done to you. So, on shot and show, big on quiz again, big on quiz again, ask Okay, so before we start, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to give you the code. So the code this week is, on fuckle gwaelga er door, which we all know is Doris. Excellent. So what you can do now is, Take the word Doris and write that down the side of the page. Okay, Scraven Fuckle Doris Ertave on Lanach. Okay, and what we can, uh, that then is going to help you when I ask you the questions. Keshtahen, question one. Okay, now remember the answer to this question starts with the letter D. Okay, so Keshtahen, Kada and Konde in Ola, Kada and Konde in Ola, the county in Ulster. Le brat bui agus glas. Brat. Brat is an gwelge er flag. Bui agus glas. Great. Kesh the dough. Now, remember, tosian on fuckle shot is an litter o. Okay, so kesh the dough. Kade on fuckle gwelge er on word hungry. Okay, so tothirsha urum. I'm tired. Ta tartarum, I'm thirsty. Ta urum, I'm hungry. Cash to three. Okay, now remember, ta sin an fuckle sha, leshan litter or. Okay, now tarlian on Tour de France, gat blian, serank. The Tour de France, every year happens in France. Okay, Nadine a glock and part, Tour de France. Okay, sian shiad, er rodegan. Saras, they sit on something during the race. Cut the fuckle chin. Cash the car. Now remember, tossing on fuckle shop, let's litter A. Okay, right. Sydney. Sydney is a cotter moor satir shop. Cowell and cotter, Sydney. Cotter is a city. Cowell and cotter, Sydney. Cash the quick on cash the so, remember, Tosin on Fuckle Shaw, Lesson Litter S. Tosin on Fuckle Shaw, Lesson Litter S. It starts with S. Cinemoniot. The money of the shack. Hurley. Cinemoniot. Cain Tanamata, Aaron Leherod, a Usoid in the Himrori. Cain Tanam. Which name? A ta Aaron Leherod is on the ball that the hurlers use. Magalore, guys. Shindera and quiz. 
Okay, remember, you have the code DURUS. Use that to help you answer the questions. Those questions then get emailed into uh, progress at hfss.ie or you can WhatsApp the, your answers to the progress WhatsApp number. Okay, big shock then, Jessica. Slon. So check out this logo. We put it in last week and it was created and designed and coloured and sent in by Moonia. So thank you so much. Keep sending them in and yours might be right down there next week. Thanks a million Mr. Cooney. It was great to have you back for the quiz and we hope to see you again next week. We've got the word code for your English sentence and we've got the word inish for your Irish sentence. Is, us, inish, may. Now we're off to Miss Coughlin for a music lesson where she talks about traditional Irish music and rashers and sausages. Hey everyone, welcome back to this week's music lesson. Today we're going to be learning all about Irish traditional music. Where to start? Well, Traditional Irish, or trad music for short, was brought to Ireland by the Celts over 2,000 years ago. It's a big part of our culture here in Ireland, and thousands of tourists come here every year just to hear the music. How cool is that? The Flat Ceol is an Irish traditional music competition that is held during the summer months. Since 1951, thousands of people have come from near and far to participate in the competition to see who is the best musician in Ireland. When I was younger, I participated in the County Fla, Monster Fla and All Ireland Fla, where I played in the solo harp competition and the group of Keol. Irish trad music began as an aural tradition, which meant that people learned tunes by hearing them. They didn't have music notes written on paper, but instead they listened to their relatives playing tunes and then learned to play what they heard. You can say that Irish trad music was passed from generation to generation. Did you know that there are many different types of trad tunes. They all sound pretty different from each other. But how would I know which one's which? Well, today we are going to learn the names of trad tunes and are going to learn a useful rhyme to help us remember each tune. Get those listening ears on. To remember a jig, we use rashers and sausages as the rhyme. So we are going to play a tune in a moment and you're going to try and say rashers and sausages repetitively along to the song. Ready? For a reel, we say black and decker, black and decker, black and decker, black and decker. So when you hear the tune, say black and decker, black and decker, and that means it is a reel. A reel usually sounds quite fast, so for today's lesson, we are just going to play a reel slowly so that you can practice saying black and decker. It's quite tricky, I won't lie. Black and decker, black and decker, black and decker, black and decker, black and decker. A hornpipe has a jumpy sound, so we use whoopsie daisy, whoopsie daisy, whoopsie daisy. So if you're going to fall, a whoopsie daisy, that's for a hornpipe. The last tune we are going to learn about is a polka, and the rhyme we use for this is tea and coffee, tea and coffee. Tea and coffee, 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 tea and coffee. So now you've learned four different types of Irish traditional tunes. I'm going to play four separate tunes after this clip 
and you must use your rhymes that you learned to figure out which tune is which. Have fun! <laughs> Miss Coughlin, thank you so much for teaching us all about traditional Irish music. Whoops a daisy, says Miss Coughlin, and the Irish word we've taken is egg shinnum. Via Muntor egg shinnum Irish kyol sin kyak shin. The teacher was playing a musical instrument in that lesson. Now we're off to Miss McGowan for some story time, where an adventure takes a trip to the moon. This is our story this week. It's called The Darkest Dark. And this book was actually written by an author who's also an astronaut. The Darkest Dark. Chris was an astronaut, an important and very busy astronaut. When it was time to take a bath, he told his mother, I'd love to, but I'm saving the planet from aliens. When it was time to get out of the bath and to go to bed, he told his father politely, because astronauts are always polite. Sorry, no can do. I'm on my way to Mars. An astronaut's work is never done. So astronauts do not like to sleep. But their parents do. You're a big boy now, said Chris's father. You have to sleep in your own bed. And Chris tried, he really did. But his room was dark, very, very dark. The kind of dark that attracts the worst sort of aliens. But his parents meant it. Chris was going to sleep in his own bed tonight. His mum and dad checked under his bed and in the wardrobe and even in his underwear drawer. They declared the room 100% alien free. They tucked Chris in, they turned on the nightlight, they even gave him a special bell to ring if he was nervous. And there's the paper showing, moonbound. Spacemen will be speeding at over 24,000 miles per hour. Clang, 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 clang. They took away the bell. And then his father said something that worried Chris even more than the dark did. One more peep, young man, and I'm afraid we'll all be too tired to go next door tomorrow. <gasps> but tomorrow would be a special day, a very special day. Chris had to go next door. His life pretty much depended on it. So Chris stayed in his own bed without a peep. It took a long time to fall asleep, but when he did, he had his favorite dream. He flew his spaceship all the way to the moon. The next day seemed to last forever. But finally, when the moon was shining over the lake, and the summer wind was ruffling the leaves of the trees, Chris ran next door. The house was already full of people, all gathered around the TV. The only TV on the whole island. Chris found a spot where he could see through the crowd. And what he saw was astronauts, real live astronauts on the actual far away moon. They were wearing puffy white suits and jumping for joy, jumping so high because there was so much less gravity there. The grown-ups huddled around the TV were amazed. 
their whole lives long, they'd never expected to see this sight. Even Chris, who had been to the moon just the night before, was amazed. He'd never really noticed how dark it was there. Outer space was the darkest dark ever. That night, Chris did a little experiment. He turned off all the lights in his room, even the night light. It was still dark, very, very dark. There were still shadows that looked a little, well, alien. Nothing had changed, but Chris had changed. He'd seen that the darkness of the universe was so much bigger and deeper than the darkness in his room, but he was not afraid. He wanted to explore every corner of the night sky. For the first time, Chris could see the power and mystery and velvety black beauty of the dark. And he realized, you're never really alone there. Your dreams are always with you, just waiting big dreams about the kind of person you want to be. Wonderful dreams about the life you will live. Dreams that actually can come true. What an amazing story, Miss McGowan. The English word we've taken from that is astronaut and the Irish word is Telavish. August in and scale shin we got the na vacant a Telavish awan. Now it's time to relax, take some deep breaths in, and we're off to Miss Fell's house for a lovely yoga edition. Take it away, Miss Fell. boys and girls. Today I'm going to talk you through a three-part breathing exercise. The first part of this exercise is you're going to inhale, breathe in through your nose and you're going to fill your belly with your breath. The second part of this exercise, breathing in, inhaling and filling up your belly and under your rib cage with your breath. And the third part of this exercise is you're going to inhale, breathing in, filling up your belly filling up under your rib cage and bringing your breath right into your upper chest. Now let's just take a moment to quieten things down. Bring yourself into a seated position. Notice the parts of your body now that's in contact with the ground. Bring your attention now to your whole body. How is your body feeling right now? Is there any tightness or tension? Or is it at ease? Just notice. Now bring your attention to your mind space. How is your mind feeling right now? Is it busy with thoughts? Or is there stillness and quietness? Just notice. There's no right or there's no wrong. Now gently place your hands on your belly and allow your middle finger to touch ever so slightly. We're going to start our breathing exercise. Inhale, breathing in through your nose, filling up your belly with your breath. And exhale slowly, let the breath go. Inhale, breathing in, see if you can fill your belly like a big balloon. And exhale, breathe out slowly. Inhale, breathing in, fill up that belly like a big balloon. And exhale, let your breath go. Placing your hands now on your rib cage and allowing your little finger to touch ever so gently. Now inhale, breathing in through your nose, filling up your belly and see if you can bring that breath under your hands, under your rib cage. And exhale, breathing out slowly. Inhale, breathing in, filling up your belly, filling up under your hands. And exhale. Breathing out. Inhale, breathe in. Fill up that belly, fill up under your rib cage. And exhale slowly. Let your breath go. Now place your hands on your upper chest. 
Once again, allowing your middle fingers to touch ever so gently. Now take the deepest breath, breathing in, fill up your belly, fill up under your rib cage, and bring your breath right into your upper chest. And exhale, breathe out slowly and gently. Inhale, breathe in through your nose, fill up that belly, fill up under your rib cage, bring that breath right into your upper chest. And exhale, let the breath go. Last round, really deep breath. Inhale, filling up that belly, filling up under the rib cage, bringing your breath right into your upper chest. And exhale slowly, let it all go. Now place your hands on the inside of your knees. Bring your awareness once again back to your body. How is your body feeling after the three part breath? Now bring your awareness to your mind space. How is your mind feeling after doing the three part breath? Now gently open your eyes, stretch out your arms, inhale, rise up high, palms together, Exhale, palms to heart space. Namaste. This fell, thank you so much. We do love the yoga segments. And the English word is inhale. And the opposite of that is exhale. And the Irish word is bog, which is Gown, bale, strong, sul, clues, and bog. Now we're off to the cooking corner to Miss Teresa Glynn, where she invites us into her kitchen to create something tasty. Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Glynn, and I'm going to start make uh, scones for you this morning. Now basically make sure that your hands are clean before you start and all your stuff is ready. Have all your stuff out. Preferably if you had a weight, better again. So basically your flour, you will need 340 grams of flour, which I've already weighed out. You put that into your bowl. And you need 75 grams of margarine or flour. You take that up and you chop it up into small pieces and you put it into the flour. So now, I'm gonna start bringing it in, lifting it up, put a little air into it, until it resembles fine breadcrumbs. Now I meant to say it in the beginning, make sure you have your oven turned on to have it heated at 175 degrees. So basically, that's what your bread is going to look like, like fine breadcrumbs, so I have it all mixed up. Now in the center, make a little hole, and get one egg, Beat the egg into the bowl. Now, there you go. Now, what I do sometimes is I put in some castor sugar. Some people don't, some people do. I don't really measure it. I just take about a handful of it in my hand, about that much, and I just spread it around. Now, I'll put my egg in. Now, I'm going to add the milk and to kind of a soft. You know, consistency, I'll show you exactly what it's going to be like when I have it done. Now make sure at all times you have an adult with you helping you to do this because it's not easy, you know, it's well, it's not that it's hard, but it's nice to have somebody just to help you along and especially when you're going into the oven. Now, you know when your hands are full of dough, which the way you put your hands into the flour and do this, it actually gets rid of all the dough. I'm going to get my sieve put some flour into the sieve watch me now and then I'll put it on the board on my counter and I'll turn this around that it won't be sticking so I'll put it on the flour I can show it to you it's going to look like that then I have my I have my my tray here with some grease proof paper in it and I just dust it with flour and now I have my cutters see my cutters so I'm going to use this size it's about that size I kind of dip it in the flour because it won't stick I flatten out my dough and I'll cut it that's one two 
So because I'm doing this two, three. Oh, I'll put the rest together because I don't want to waste any of the dough. So I'll bring it together again. Now, the most important thing I always do with the remainder, if I have any little bit of egg left or a little drop of milk left over, I get a brush. Now I've been put into the oven and at 175 degrees as I said and about 15 uh, minutes give and take uh, you can check them uh, but you will see I'm rising and you will know by them now if you have a little skewer you can put it through a very very skinny knife to make sure that they come out dry but if you lift up the scone and tap it in the bottom and it's a kind of a hollow sound that means it's fully baked and you will know by the outside as well that it'll be nice brown and crispy it will be lovely for 11 o'clock with butter and um, jam or even cream in the side but a lovely cup of tea for whoever's in the house to treat be a beautiful treat so the scones are done so i now just take them out of the oven the most important thing is while Scones are baking, clean up after you because your parents will look and allow you to cook again or bake again. So now here are your scones. You can see the bottom are cooked, baked. So they'll be nice for a nice cup of tea or hot chocolate or however you would like to treat. I hope you enjoy this. Miss Glynn, I can smell those scones from here, and they're great! So the English word is scone, and the Irish word is egg balkal. Vian Muntor, egg balkal sa histine. Now we have a history challenge with Mr. Corbett, where he teaches us how to create a unique historical project. Thanks Mr. Reed and hello everyone. I'm not going to keep you too long today, but I do have a little bit of a history challenge for you. I've been thinking a lot about all the viewers of Progress TV from junior infants all the way up to sixth class, and I know they will be interested in lots of different things in history. So I needed to pick a topic that would be interesting for everyone to start. And I eventually had the perfect topic. This. Yeah, that's me. And yeah. I am a lot more hairy now. But no, I don't want you to do a project on me. I want you to do a project on you. And not just on you, I want you to do a project on your birthday. Go on to Google, find out about famous events that happened on the day that you were born. Get one that you find really interesting and do a project on it. You can do pictures, write it up, do it on a computer, maybe make an art project on it. I don't mind. If nothing really interesting happened on the day that you were born, find out about someone famous who shares the same birthday as you and do a project on them. It doesn't have to be the exact year that you were born. It can just be the same date. To get you started, I'm going to give you a little idea about what my project will be about. And maybe if you can figure this out, you can figure out what date I was born. And also watch here. So, on the day that I was born, the spacecraft Voyager 2 flew the closest to Neptune that it ever did. And it sent back pictures of Neptune's surface to Earth. If you can figure out that and figure out my age, you're doing very well. If I was doing this project, I would do it on Neptune or I would do it on the spacecraft Voyager 2. And I would upload it to WhatsApp, or to our progress email, or to our teacher Seesaw. That's your history challenge this week. Best of luck and send in those entries. Hopefully you don't find out how old I am. Bye. Mr. Corbett, what an amazing history challenge here. Send us in your projects, and the English word is project, put it into a sentence, and the Irish word is brehla. Keen daughter a dovrehla. What date is your birthday? Now, we're off to Miss Kennedy 
for a lesson on urban and rural life. Urban in the town and rural in the countryside. Take it away, Miss Kennedy. Hi everybody, it's Miss Kanhidi here. I hope you're all keeping well. We're back here in Limerick and today we're going to look at urban areas versus rural areas. So at the moment I'm here in a rural area, so let's take a look. A rural area is an area outside a city or a town. It's usually a farming area and it looks like this. are far quieter than urban areas. There isn't as many cars on the road and also you can hear nature. Take a listen and see what you can hear. The houses in rural areas can look different to the ones in urban areas. Here's a few pictures of some rural area houses. Bungalows, detached houses, farmhouses and cottages. Rural areas also have smaller roads. They're quite narrow and sometimes they can have grass in the middle of them. In some parts of rural areas the trees can grow so tall that they cover over the road like this one here. In rural areas there are lots of farming lands and fields. You might find animals in these fields. I found a nice place to sit and I'm actually sitting on a bridge. So if you come over here with me, you can see the water that flows under the bridge. I've just finished up my walk here in my rural area. To summarise, rural areas are quieter, you can hear nature, they are greener, and finally, because they have more farmland, there are more farm animals to be seen. Here we are in an urban area. An urban area is a built up area and lots of people live here. Examples of urban areas include towns and cities. There are lots more houses in urban areas compared to rural areas. Examples of houses that you might find in urban areas include apartments, terraced houses, detached and semi-detached houses. As you can see, there's lots more houses, which means more people. The roads are busier too, there's more vehicles, such as cars, trucks and vans. Urban areas are very busy animals, and because of this, buses run in towns, and people can choose to take these instead of taking their car. As you can tell from the sound, it's much busier and noisier in urban areas compared to rural areas. There's more shops, workplaces, factories and leisure facilities. As you can see, it's busier on the roads here and about traffic lights and bridges and into traffic. Here I am on a To summarise, urban areas are busier, noisier, they have more shops, workplaces and more people. Do you live in an urban or rural area? Let me know by sending in a photo or picture. Bye for now. Miss Kennedy, thank you so much for teaching us about urban and rural life. The English word we've taken from that is detached. A detached house or an attached house, a terraced house, a bungalow. I know all about them now. And the Irish word is orison, which is apartment. Ta in a in orison.
Now we're off to learn all about the seasons with Miss Hines. Miss Hines, take it away! Hello everybody. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Today I would like to talk to you about the four seasons. Spring, summer, autumn and winter. Or in Irish, on Tarak, on Sara, on Four, on Gira. I'm going to talk about two of those seasons today, autumn and winter. Now, last autumn, I had a very special visitor who came into my front garden. I'll give you some clues. He has a small body and his body is covered in spines. That's right. It was on Grand Yolk, or in English, the hedgehog. I can tell you I got so excited, I ran to my phone opened the window and filmed him for you. And now today I'd like to share that clip with you and I'd like you to enjoy it and listen carefully because you will see what the hedgehog is doing in my garden. He is having a drink from a leaf on the ground. And you'll know it's autumn because you'll see all the fallen leaves on the ground. The other clip I want to share with you is in winter time. I took this video footage of my little dog Oz when he first experienced the big snowfall of 2018. Remember we had some days off from school then as well. Well you can imagine how excited Oz was to go out and play in the snow. So in that little video clip you will see as well the signs of winter. The trees are bare and it's snowing. Here I am out and about looking for the signs of spring and I'm in my urban environment. Spring has sprung! Ta on Parok Lin. That means spring is with us. Now today I'd like to focus on one wild flower that grows here, the bluebell. It's my favourite spring flower and the reason it's called the bluebell is because if you look at the flower it has a lovely tubular shape. Okay, let's move on now to my favourite tree of all time. You know it as the conquer tree but its name is the horse chestnut tree. As you can see, it's in bloom at the moment and it has a lovely white blossom. Now, if we look at the stem, we see that it has five leaflets on the stem and they're very broad leaves. This is the tree that we get our lovely conkers from in the autumn. Remember, they grow the really hard, spiky shell on the outside and then it spits open when it falls to the ground and you get to play a lovely game of conkers. So, here I am in this wonderful green area that hasn't been cut yet, so there are lots of lovely wild flowers and plants to be seen. Here we have the dandelion clock. It doesn't say tick and it doesn't say talk, but when I was a little girl, I was told that if you blow on it, you'll be able to tell the time. One, o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. Oh, different times because it is not six o'clock, it's eleven o'clock in the morning. Okay, I see another lovely flower over here that I want to make my way over to. Let's go. These are another of my favourite spring flowers and they are from the primrose family and they are a wild flower. And we don't get to see these too often in an urban environment, so they are very special. So these are just a few signs of spring. And when you're out with your parents for your walk, I want you to turn on your senses. Look up, look down, look around and listen. Listen for the birds and you will be surprised what you can find in your environment. That's all I have for you today. Oh, only to mention that you probably, if you listen carefully to the hedgehog clip, hear this little guy barking because he too got very excited. Okay, 
that's it for today. Thanks for listening and watching. Take care and we do miss you all very much. Miss Hines, thanks for the wonderful education and teaching us all about the different seasons in the year. The English word we've taken from that is spring and the Irish word is spring in Irish on Tarok. It's even now on Tarok. Now we're off to the farm to get an education on biodiversity. Mr. Bell, feed it to us. Dave got dinner. I guess fault your over Asherish. On our farm, we have a huge amount of biodiversity. So biodiversity refers to anything that lives and grows here naturally. If you listen carefully, you have to hear the birds sing. Well, it's nesting season, and these are just some eggs that I've stumbled upon while checking the animals. We can see these have hatched, and they're from different birds. So maybe why not have a look at these? This is a little bit smaller than a hen's egg. And this is significantly smaller. You can see the colour of it. We have a very pale blue. I wonder what kind of birds had these eggs. Why not check it out on Google? We also have a huge selection of different native trees on the farm. Here beside me, it's our one and only beech tree. It's one of my favourite trees on the farm. Beside that, we have a beautiful tree with a white blossom. Now we call it a white thorn but many of you may know it by a different name. It's also known as the Hawthorn, and I'm sure many of you have read the famous book Under the Hawthorn Tree. And then right beside that again, we can see the leaves of an ash tree. So I have to say, those are three of my favorite trees here on the farm. So as well as all the different birds that I've seen and eggs that I've gathered and the trees, I've also seen many, many wild animals over the last few years on the farm. I've seen wild deer across to our fields. I've seen many foxes. Uh, this year in particular, I've seen two ducks around quite a lot. You might remember I referred to the low-lying fields as carcasses. They have drains with water. So the ducks were attracted there. And this year, I even saw a swan. So when I was checking the cows, I could see that this one was looking very curiously into the drain. I knew there was something there. So I went over to have a look, and this is what I found. Just a single swan, seemed quite happy and content, swimming around in the drain. They also see many, many insects and different small creatures, uh, like ladybirds and butterflies. I see a lot of rabbits and hares, and the last few years, I see a lot of foxes. They like to hang around when the sheep are lambing. And if they get an opportunity, they might like to try and steal a newborn lamb. So we try to avoid that. Here's a cheeky fox, as you can see, coming really close to the house. So over the next few weeks on the farm, We'll be shearing the sheep and we'll be making some bales of silage for winter feed. Uh, in the meantime, why not check out some of the biodiversity that exists near your house? So on. Mr. Bell, what a wonderful lesson. Taught us all about biodiversity in his farm and also Ivica eggs in Irish. V na hivaka le fecol eran talov eran verm. Now, Progress TV wants you to send your clips in of all these activities and the seesaw activities. And then next week, if you send them in, you can see yourself on our YouTube channel in the kids' highlights reel. Until next time, take it away. No, 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 wait! We're going to end with some rap music. Just like we began with, I want you to create a verse of a rap song, send it in, and we'll show that in the highlights reel again. Uh, uh.